Okay, it's five or two, so I'm gonna get us rolling. Um, we're so excited to have you all here today. And oh my gosh, I love that I'm already seeing raised hands. So I'm glad you have come here with questions. Um, so my name is Nell Hood. I am the educational programs manager for the Wild Seed Project. And um, we are a main based nonprofit dedicating dedicated to building back biodiversity through the community collection and distribution of seeds. Um, we are so excited to be having this webinar today about um, planting for climate resilience. Um, it's something we at Wild Seed Project have been thinking really hard about um, over the past many years and specifically for the past year as we've been getting ready to uh, publish this guide called Planting for Climate Resilience, um, which is forthcoming this May, which is so exciting. Um, and so we're just here to be all together in this room talking about what we've been seeing um, at, in terms of climactic changes across the Northeast and elsewhere. Um, we're here to talk about what we've been seeing and how plants have been adapting, how we have been adapting our growing strategies, and in how we're just thinking towards the future. So um, we're super excited. We've got a lot of information to pack into this hour. And um, also, we are really excited about participation from you all um, because this is a Q&A. So um, a couple people submitted questions beforehand, but as you have questions, please use the Q&A feature that I've already seen that people are using um, at the bottom of your screen to put your questions in the Q&A. If you have reactions or responses or any other information, please keep that to the chat and keep your specific questions that you want us to answer to the Q&A. If we get a lot of questions, I'm not positive we'll be able to get through them, but I would recommend we can save the, the chat and the Q&A. So if you have questions that we should be thinking about, please just make sure to write them down um, in, some, in some form so that we can get to them. So we are really excited to be talking about climate resilience, but as um, we are starting this program that's about land and um, change, I also want to um, begin with gratitude and understanding for this land. Um, gratitude, yeah, for this land, life-giving land, the unceded ancestral Wabanaki territory we now call Maine. Gratitude for the relationships that sustain us here, the processes much bigger than us, the way the seeds and bulbs are still germinating after such a trying winter, the way the birds have still returned in the middle of a spring snow and ice storm beginning to build their, build their nests. I am personally so grateful for the way life is still thriving here, and I also want to express gratitude for the longtime care of this place by the Indigenous people who have built and sustained relationships with all other living beings, co-creating the thriving ecosystem of the Dawnland. And we also need to begin with understanding, understanding of the ways in which colonization has violently removed Wabanaki communities from their land, understanding of the resilience of Wabanaki people and culture that is surviving attempted genocide, and understanding the inherent sovereignty of the tribes of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn. The Abenaki, Holton Band of Maliseet Indians, Mi'kmaq Nation, the Penobscot Nation, and the Passamaquoddy Tribe. Climate change is a materialization of a settler relationship with land, resources, and non-human life, and we have to understand how these things are linked. As we also, as we do our work at Wild Seed Project, we are clear this knowledge and information that we are about to share and talk through, and these ways of understanding relationships with plants and the land and kind of these, these iterative processes um, did not start, nor will they end with us. The resources we are going to share are gathered from so many teachers, both human and non-human, and we encourage you to learn more about the historical and present-day relationships of Indigenous communities to the place you live, and join us in working towards climate resilience and um, Indigenous sovereignty. Um, and today we're going to talk about climate change and climate resilience and how humans can work to foster climate resilient landscapes. But first we want to be clear about the changes we are already seeing and experiencing here in Maine. And that leads me to um, being super excited to introduce my two other uh, coworkers who I'm going to spotlight. I, uh, actually, that might, I'll, I'll try spotlighting you and see if it helps. <laughs> um, but uh, Maura Sanchi um, and Emily Baisden, who both work in the seed nursery and um, are doing really amazing on the ground work and have a lot to share with us today. So Maura, I will pass it off to you. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Nell. Um, and welcome, everyone. So um, we just wanted to kick it off a bit uh, by explaining some of the like current and obvious, I guess, impacts of climate change that we are currently experiencing and that we expect 
to continue to worsen as things carry on. Um, and so the first one we wanted to highlight is just the predicted shift um, in plant um, habitat. So as temperatures rise, we're going to see that kind of reflected in um, zones shifting, whether that be your hardiness zone or like even potentially maybe an ecoregion. Um, but the populations of plants are going to follow that trend. So plants that are able to adapt to warmer climates are going to do so and thrive and um, kind of push their um, habitats northward as like the area with which they can inhabit expands within a warmer climate. So that's one of the first kind of indicators that like uh, climate change is showing us. The other one, which is perhaps a little more um, apparent to especially those of us up in Maine, um, and it's just a bit clearer, especially in the past, uh, I'd say, year, but especially a few days, um, is just fluctuations in um, the temperatures, sorry, the um, fluctuations in um, weather patterns, essentially. Um, so that can look like a couple different things. Um, We've obviously been experiencing some warmer winters. This winter is a really great example. We had very little snow, especially in those early winter months, December, January, February. And then a couple of days into spring, we experienced one of the largest, or I guess, yeah, largest snowfalls we've seen so far this season. Um, that's really uncharacteristic of a healthy climate and uh, characteristic of a changing one. Um, that's also just, I want to highlight here that we're seeing uh, different ends of the extremes. So yes, we're seeing lots of rain and lots of um, warmer temperatures, but we're also seeing drier situations and even some blue cold temperatures like we saw last year with that kind of um, super cold event randomly later in this, the winter. Um, in, yeah, so those are some of the things that we are currently experiencing right now. Um, and with that come some like added uh, stresses in terms of flooding that can destroy not only human infrastructure, but like habitat or human built infrastructure, but habitat as well. Um, so that has lots of implications on our plants that we know and love, as well as animals and humans ourselves. Great. Thanks, Maura. Um, yeah, like what Maura was saying, we're, we're getting some really uh, extreme weather events happening. Um, and my background is really in um, plants and entomology and multi-trophic level interactions. Um, and and one of the, the things that we can talk about is what's our habitats are being affected, where are wild seed projects, so we're a plant face facing organization. Um, so, you know, plants aren't going to solve the climate change problem. Um, we don't have control over what corporations are doing. We know that like 70 plus percent of, of our carbon issues come from, from massive companies and things like that. And there's not much we can do about that. Um, but there are things that we can do about biodiversity in the landscapes that we spend our time in um, and that we care about. Um, and just some, some little background about what's happening right now kind of in the world. Um, we know things like birds and insects, which are really good indicators of ecosystem health, uh, are, are seeing massive issues in their diversity and abundance. Um, like one in four birds have disappeared since about the 70s. Um, that's a lot of birds, that's, that's billions and billions of birds. Uh, studies are showing that anywhere from 40 to 75% of insects are disappearing. Um, and these are the things that really keep our ecosystems functioning, keep our food webs moving, um, keep plants being pollinated and reproducing and having seed. Um, we know that diversity leads to community stability. Diversity is good on so many levels. Um, and there are studies after studies that say the right type of diversity for the right ecosystem is what helps maintain ecosystem functioning and ecosystem services. Um, currently, a lot of our land is very fragmented. Um, which makes any sort of plant migration in the change of climate in the face of climate change or climate warming um, really, really difficult. Um, we're also talking time scales that um, are well beyond what plants move at. Um, plants move at millennial time scales, and what we're seeing are decades, um, hundred year time scales of change here. So that's a pretty um, extreme difference. I was I joke a lot that like rocks are really good at understanding that kind of time scale, but humans really struggle with that type of time scale, um, myself included. And 
there's things that we can do to promote biodiversity um, and think about how our landscapes are changing and the things that we can plant to both encourage the animal life, but also can encourage the plants um, to be able to survive. We are going to be losing some plants in the face of what's going on here. Um, we know things like uh, sugar maples are, are really pushed right now. That's a, a good indicator species for this area that's super reliant on maples. But at the same time, there's people doing really, really good work um, all along northern North America in trying to, to help save our sugar maples. Um, and looking towards um, indigenous groups that have been working on this for so long that are so uh, connected to these plants and these habitats are, are really an important way that we can go about um, helping these creatures. Um, so just a little background on the guide that's coming out um, and kind of the, the first start that we wanna think about um, when we're thinking about planting for climate resilience is really getting to know your site characteristics. Um, so first off, what we do for any planting or any garden, whether climate change is happening or not, um, is just knowing what kind of light and what kind of soil moisture you have. Um, and if any of you have gotten um, our guides in the past, we usually have little indicators that show wet loving species or shade loving species. So you can get to know your site, um, which really takes going, going out and looking at your soil, seeing if it's gravelly, seeing if it's dry. Um, but a lot of this stuff, especially the, the wet and dry soils are looking to be more extreme. And that's not necessarily more extreme all the time. That seems to be kind of more annual fluctuations. We know last year was super, super wet but the year before that was super, super dry. So it's really important to, to think and, and read your landscape to get a good idea of, of what you think um, you're gonna have to deal with. Uh, the next thing, which is new in the, the upcoming guide, um, are these things that, that we know are happening um, both with uh, urban sprawl and the way that our we manage our land, um, plus uh, climate change, issues, things like drought and flooding. We're going to see higher salts. I was just recently talking about how this past ice storm, um, it's pretty late in the season to be adding more salt to our roads. So non-salt tolerant plants are going to struggle more this year, especially if they had started to emerge already um, and then just got a whole bunch of salt dumped on them from all that ice we just got. Um, if anybody is in Maine, they, they know that we just got a whole bunch of ice um, and a whole bunch of snow. Uh, last weekend. <laughs> um, and then also we're with sea level rise, both both ocean level rise and we're seeing our rivers really swell. Um, I think that that last big storm, the Androscoggin River rose like 20 feet. Um, so we're going to see a lot more erosion and things like that. Um, and being proactive with what we plant can really be beneficial um, to help us in the long run. Um, and really thinking about, you know, multiple generations and multiple plant life cycles ahead of time can be really um, beneficial. So I wanna get to our questions um, and I guess I will pass it over to Nell, if that makes sense. Great. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, and we can stop sharing the screen now if that works. Um, Thank you. Perfect. So um, yeah, great. That's just a little bit of the context that we are coming to this from that, like we are seeing this happen in real time. Um, and we know that there's lots we can do for advocacy and activism and like these bigger scale uh, ways that we're engaging with climate justice, but then there's these really tangible landscape level ways that we are thinking about getting ourselves and our communities, communities, including the more than human life that we are so bound up with, um, ready for what's coming. So um, the first question I think is kind of what Emily and Mara were just touching on that we we have gotten a lot of, um, of questions about, I think mostly because it's this time of year, but um, winters are really important for plants in this area and like the long cold winter. And a lot of people are wondering if this winter was even cold enough to like promote the germination of a lot of plants. If um, we're going to see different plants germinate because of the um, lack of cold this winter, like how is how is this, um, I think, recordly warm winter going to um, do you expect it to be uh, impacting a lot of the plants we work with and just like that are growing around us here in Maine? Um, I can talk a bit about that. 
Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm like winter, the idea of winter sewing is new to me. I come from uh, like a food agriculture background more so. Um, and so in terms of like food growing, there's some positive implications there. We're kind of seeing an extension of the season in which we can grow, which could be really good and promising, especially for people in the agriculture industry. Um, along with that comes lots of other issues that kind of affect farmers and growers. Um, but for something like native plants that, especially native to Maine and regions in the Northeast that have really learned to adapt to this, these seasons, there's four distinct seasons marked by different characteristics. Um, they kind of rely on this um, winter cold to kind of get around these mechanisms that all of our seeds have developed to protect them throughout the seasons. So um, a lot of our native seeds have these really hard seed coats that require them, require a freeze thaw period to break them down. Um, so it's not so much they need like 100 days of sub freezing temperatures, it's more that fluctuation. Um, obviously, as we kind of stretch like the maximum warm period we see each winter, that's that fluctuation is going to diminish a bit. Um, that kind of <laughs> it's, it's going to be less cold, more warm. Um, but it really is about that fluctuation. So um, we've still been experiencing some colder days and some warmer days. And together that like freezing and then thawing out and freezing and thawing out will kind of work to um, facilitate the growing of our native plants. Um, it's interesting, though, I um, there's especially in the, the food agriculture world, there's a huge um, a lot of discussion about like storing seed um, and something that was new to me uh, working here at Wild Seed Project and just getting to know native plants is that kind of the preferred way to store seeds and create seed banks is um, through living seed banks, which is something we've talked about a lot at Wild Seed Project. Um, and I think that things like that will become vastly more important, especially in these unpredictable times. Um, what that does that like storing seeds in a fridge in a building won't do is it um, ex makes forces our plants to experience changes. Um, and so it's kind of like create like forcing them to evolve to these changing climates. Um, so if we grow our plants outside and have them experience warmer weathers, there's some potential to like push them to thrive more in these warmer temperatures. Obviously, we can't like create conditions if a plant is not equipped to thrive at a certain temperature. When we reach that certain temperature, simply growing the plant won't trick that. We can't get around that, but um, growing things outside and allowing them to experience the changes is hopefully our best option. Emily, anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that was absolutely. Um, and I think more really hit the nail on the head there with um, the plants need those fluctuating temperatures, which we we have been getting those. Um, and, you know, there's a lot we just don't we don't know yet. You know, this is this is new for us. We're used to having snowpack on the ground, um, at least for weeks of the year. Uh, um, our plants have have evolved through multiple like minor climate things. Um, so it's totally possible that the, that some will be fine. You know, there's like 17,000 native plants in America or North America. Um, you know, some aren't going to be able to adapt to the, this, um, but some will, um, and we'll just keep trying to, to find ways to, to help save them and potentially a, a good mix of seed banking, the type with, deep freezes and things like that to save some of the rare species or some of the species that are um, more likely to have struggles, things like alpine species, things like um, uh, some of the coastal species, things that are, are going to get hit the quickest that we're already seeing um, start to disappear. Those are the ones that we should probably be focusing on banking. Um, and then the continual allowing them to adapt as perennials tend to adapt even year by year. Um, plants are really good at um, putting resources to certain areas of their existence, depending on what happened the prior year. Um, so we can be pretty hopeful with that. Amazing. Um, thanks for that. And I think that the other kind of bigger question that a lot of people have been asking is about 
um, the way that these, like we were talking about at the beginning, these flooding events, either the like long-term exposure to standing water or the erosion that happens when the Androscoggin River raises 20 feet and then descends and like what happens to the plant communities that are on those riverbanks, what happens to plants that are not prepared to have like anoxic conditions for a long time? Like what what's happening there? What do you expect or anticipate for how we deal with this like major changes in the water cycle um, that plants are slowly adjusting to. Yeah, um, that's a, I'll, I'll take the first stab at that question. And, and it's a question I have as well. Um, you know, my, my basement wasn't at the water table when I moved into my house five years ago, and now it is below the water table. <laughs> um, and that goes with my backyard and the plants that I planted there when I first moved in, in a drought year compared to what's happened um, the past year. Uh, there, are, one thing that we can do, um, this doesn't help much for our, like, not our own lands or lands that we don't tend, um, but for our gardens and areas around our homes and things like that. Um, and, and in cities, a lot of our, our cities are now very, they, they need um, infrastructure for ecosystem services that plants used to be the things that provide, like sucking up water and erosion control and things like that. Um, and just planting the right plant in those types of conditions that we know are going to be flooding more and things like that can be really, really helpful. Um, there are a whole slew of, of plants that do really well in flooding conditions. Um, the guide has a bunch of those, but we also, on our website, we have a really good comprehensive plant list um, that you can kind of pick and choose what plants that you want um, for the certain types of site conditions that you have. Um, so if you're getting a lot of shady, moist areas. Um, you can find plants that will work for those. Um, as far as erosion control, I think it's really important to look at um, shrubs and um, ground covers that that spread nicely and can help, help compact that or hold that soil in place. Um, things that move, um, that reproduce fast and sucker, things like that. Um, I really like species like um, elderberry or red oats or dogwood or sweet fern um, are all really good kind of mat forming species. Um, our native uh, honeysuckle is a really, really good one. It's one that we talk about often as a good one to put in after um, removing species that, that tend to limit the biodiversity in an area and tend to spread really quickly. And that one's a good one to put, put in because it can also handle anything from pretty deep shade to pretty extreme sun and heat conditions. Um, how's that? That's anything? Perfect. No, I think that's perfect. Um, and I think that there's, there, yeah, there's so much that is like kind of going to be learned more of like after three years, if they're standing water in, in this place for three years, like it will, the, the landscape will show us what can survive there. Um, and that's kind of a part of this. So the another, I'm going to move to some questions from the chat right now um, as we're moving along. And there are some different um, questions all kind of around this idea of assisted migration. Um, uh, Nina asks, is assisted migration known to benefit pollinators, plants, or is it a theory? Um, the And then another person asked, um, about how, is it a misnomer, um, that we should start incorporating plants from warmer zones? Um, and I think that those are two, like, kind of questions that get at this broader, broader question of, should we be planting for what's coming or should we pl be planting, um, for what's here already? That's such a great question. And it's on all of our minds and we talk about it so much. Um, and that, one of the more difficult responses to that is that we really don't know yet. Um, there, there's not enough known about assisted migration. We know humans have been moving plants around North America for millennia. Um, we don't know currently if moving a Southern species or a Southern, even a, a Southern um, of the same species, a Southern adapted. So like moving Southern maples up to the North and growing them. Um, will be better or not. Uh, at this point, the, there's so much fluctuation in our climate that um, it's 
probably best to wait for more studies to come out to see how that's going to work. Um, but it is likely that um, we will see some assisted migration. Um, one thing that I think is really important to know is that um, a lot of plants are not going to be able to migrate as fast as our climate is changing. Um, so I think it is a really important thing to be thinking about, to be encouraging people to study and look into um, what kind of effects are going to happen. Um, we are seeing plants um, not so much like southern species moving north, but we are seeing plants start to move into like the alpine zones that aren't getting as much snow cover um, and, and out competing some of those more rare species that are, are very adapted to a specific mountaintop kind, kinds of areas. We're seeing some of like the trees and the species that would be at the bottom of a mountain moving up um, those areas and kind of crowding out those species. So I think um, to answer it in a way where if we are doing assisted migration, we have to be careful that we're not then creating more stress on plants that are here um, and are at risk. Um, that is to say, you know, uh, we have very, very fragmented lands um, and we are humans that, you know, people moved plants around. It's important for us to keep biodiversity. So at some point we need to find that balance, if that makes sense. And I can add, like, a, I guess a bit of a case study. Um, it's less about, um, like, true assist. I, I, I don't know. It, it, it is a bit of assisted migration. But anyway, um, at our seed center, uh, which is in Cape Elizabeth, so southern Maine, um, Emily started growing some pawpaws, which are, like, found in um, the, that area of Maine, not in, like, great... Um, not not in high rates, um, but like can grow there, maybe won't fruit, things like that. So just kind of experimentally, we're just we're growing them um, to see how they how they'll do. Um, it's a slightly more southern species, so it may not like uh, respond super well to our winters, but we're just like out of curiosity, kind of growing them um, on and trying to see how they handle it just in an isolated example. Um, so usually for our plants that are already grown, they they germinated last year, they're about that big um they're very cute um <laughs> and we usually overwinter our plants by covering them and protecting them a bit from the cold so we did that with some of them and we also left some out to kind of experience the elements just to see what we're working with so if that's a concern you have you can definitely try growing species that grow in your area but just not in high rates and are kind of at their like northernmost range um as things warm we may start to see them kind of progress further and further north yeah, I also, I just want to point out like the difference between assisted migration or plant, like managed relocation of plants and the difference between, which is what Maura is talking about and the difference between kind of, uh, I think they call it like managed evolution or something like that, which is what I was talking about, about bringing um, like a Southern New England aster that, you know, grows on a wide range um, outside of Maine, maybe pulling from the mid-Atlantic New England asters or something like that and have, bringing those seeds up here. Um, and and there's there's not an answer yet about this, um, but people are, are looking at it. Um, and seed banking is gonna help tell us that a bit too, because we're, we're able to find, to bank seeds from various years with various climates um, and, and study how those seeds react and respond. There's also, um, research happening now that's really exciting, um, led by Desiree Narango, that um, is looking at uh, if species can use those other species. So um, there's kind of like, uh, there's a lot of, uh, because I'm a bug person, there, there's a lot of research on on what caterpillars can eat. Um, and caterpillars are, are tend to be very uh, specialized. And that, that goes for even the ones that have like a whole bunch of plants they feed on. So a good example is like the Luna moth. The Luna moth can feed on um, oak and sweet gum and birch and all these different things. But then when you look at them regionally, they're really feeding on, on one of those plants regionally. So like our Luna moths tend to feed on like birch or oak, whereas the mid-Atlantic ones are feeding on sweet gum. Um, so so there's they're starting research of collecting um, seed from all these different regions, growing them on plants and seeing if these insects can still feed on them. Cause that's a really big question with that. Cause the whole point remember is to uplift biodiversity and help um, 
food webs. And if we, if these plants that we'd move up aren't going to be able to feed the bugs, then it kind of defeats the point a little bit. Amazing. That was a very thorough answer. Thank you both. Um, and I think obviously just like a note in within this <laughs> Q&A that like there's so much that we could we could spend five hours all together as a group talking about some of the intricacies of this. I think that this conversation is to like, yeah, pull forth some of these examples, but also just get get some of the the conversations moving about like the fact that we are thinking about this really changing future when we're planting now. Um, and so, yeah, the, and there's so many great questions coming in the chat. I think I want to ask, um, Jamie Hark asked, um, they are curious about what our thoughts are on planting strategies in distributed coastal bluffs, given the last storms, should we be promoting later succession woodland with slower growth slash deeper tap roots or grasslands and shrubland with fast growth and shallower root masses? Because those do two really different things. And I'm curious what y'all are thinking. Hmm. Wow, great question. I think that to, to me, I think it will depend on the habitat um, that is in question. Um, we know dunes, um, are high, high, high risk right now for sea level rise. Um, we also know that wetlands and marshes are like the most important breeding grounds for all the, you know, ocean creatures. Um, so I think it's really important that we think of what kind of habitats we are building. Um, I know some folks are looking at, um, sea level rise in terms of both modeling and what we are seeing currently, like high tides at full moons or new moons, um, and seeing where those dunes would shift and trying to plan for planting for that type of habitat for those species that require them. Um, I think if it's like a person's home, it probably would be good to, to put some deep taproot plants down there, just even for windbreaks and things like that, because we're on top of the sea level rise, we're also seeing extreme wind conditions. Um, <clears throat> that's a, it's a tricky one to answer. Uh, that's my first thought on it, at least. Yeah, I agree. It's gonna kind of depend on the situation, like you said, and kind of what your other considerations are. Um, but I think I think like the key will kind of be the the timing of it all. Um, there's an example I'm thinking of where lots of plants were planted and then we experienced um, a wildly high tide and they all got washed out. So I think um, regardless of what someone were to decide to plant or what was best for their situation, trying to really think like Emily said about the timing of it all um, and kind of watching our current conditions and watching for those highest tides to ensure that. Um, the, the work you put in and the plants you grow aren't just immediately stripped back away. It's really, uh, it's tough. I mean, you might think we thought winter was over, it was spring, and then we got a snowfall. So um, there's always a chance that something could happen. But yeah, I think timing will play a critical role there. Yeah. And I think the only th other thing I'm thinking about is like, and maybe you both can speak to this too, is how important it is to to keep the like roots, a lot of the root systems that are in riverbanks right now, which is again, a really complicated thing because in some of the riverbanks uh, along, I don't know, some of the suburban rivers outside of um, Portland, at least where I am right now, it's like all not weed. <laughs> and it's like, what is the benefit of like, I mean, obviously it's necessary to be able to like remove that but like what is what is the cost benefit analysis of then like creating this bare slope it's very complicated that's that's something that we're we're also wanting to highlight is that it's nuanced and it's complicated um yeah I don't know if you wanted to say anything else about that too yeah I think, I think that's a really really great point um <clears throat> When we remove plants or when plants get removed any one way or the other on these like river shores and outcrops and things like that, uh, it's really important that we um, re replace them or plant something, whether it's something that start with something that's going to grow quickly and fill in that, um, you know, shallow rooted stuff that can take off and kind of 
hold the soil in place and then move into slower growing things like shrubs that can hold in um, for longer periods of time. Um, but it's it's hard to plan ahead in an unknown kind of world, but I think that that can be uh, useful. Um, we also, if anybody has the shrub guide, we do have a whole section guild that's um, for slopes and erosion control plants. Um, so if you don't have it, I encourage you to get it. Yeah, it's slope huggers, tenacious shrubs with strong suckering growth to help hold steep slopes in place and minimize erosion while providing wildlife habitat screening and visual interest. Um, and there's a whole bunch of examples that do really well in, in different types of like sunshade or like super acidic soils um, and looking for plants like that that can can help there. That's a great, that's a great point. Yeah, already thinking about the way that those plants are there. Maura, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, this is getting like a little bit tangential, but um, I think there's some application now to what you were saying about removing plants, not just like um, plants that are not necessarily native, but but like any plant for development in these kind of sensitive habitats is something that really needs to be considered. I drive Route 1 all the time, um, straight through the Marsh, Scarborough area, and so many things keep popping up. So it's not necessarily... Um, like what can we plant to preserve those environments? But it's like, where else can this storage facility go? Like, why would we choose this sensitive habitat and destroy, whether it be native or non-native species that are growing there, like destroy these things that are already growing and established and like providing a service to us for an additional service that could be better placed elsewhere. Yes. Yeah. Great point. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it's something we rant about a lot. Uh, there's a lot of um, mismanagement of used space. And if you have any uh, involvement in your local governments, you can really make a stink about things, <laughs> um, which is kind of nice. Uh, I know in my town, there's they're putting in all these plans about rules for, for new buildings and things like that. And they have have now more additions in like needing for planting for any sort of new buildings to happen. Um, also note that I forgot to mention that uh, in the new guide, there's also a river shore outcrop section that that's all about soils like that, that are a little falling apart. <laughs> Amazing. Um, kind of in a similar vein to now talking about the guides, Amy Campbell is wondering, are there lists that rank especially more common natives that people are adding to their gardens according to their sensitive sensitivity to all these different conditions, i.e. very wet or very dry? Or is it better to just have a good selection of different species to cover the bases? Um, and I guess I'll just add on, like, is there, are there like uh, rock stars that are coming out um, in, in these um in these like big fluctuations. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I know that Emily, I, we were talking the other day about how important it is just to have seeds and plants that are able to like grow in each of these. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear you talk through that again. Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, the guide does have, it's, it's split up in a nice way. I don't know if you remember in the, um, slide, deck from the beginning, it showed um, little icons uh, and it has for each plant that's highlighted um, what it is incredibly resilient at. Um, we picked all species that have some sort of um, highly uh, high ability to be resilient about whether it's droughts or floods or salt tolerance or compaction or um, uh, erosion um, abilities. And a lot of them have multiple things with them. Um, and then it breaks them into community of the, the essential site conditions. So sunny or um, things like that, center shade. Um, personally, I think with, with like the average yard that is now going to see times of drought and times of flood, and there's, it's really difficult to know which year, what you're going to get which year. Um, is to to plant a good a good mix is what I've I've generally been telling and generally been doing myself as well is just um you know ha having enough diversity in my what would be normal average soil garden bed um of something that is going to be both drought couple species that are drought tolerant a couple species that are um, more flood tolerant um so that there's always something each year that's doing well these species don't tend to like the, the drought tolerant one probably won't die after a year of wet 
softness. Uh, um, it just won't do so well, but that dry one will do fine. Um, where the, or I don't know, the other way around. <laughs> um, and, and that means just like year to year, you'll have something that's providing pollen and nectar and whatever shelter, or food sources, things like that. Um, and fill, filling a role of a plant doing all those ecosystem services while the other one may be dormant or maybe struggling for a year or something like that. Um, I think, I think that's one of the big things in our gardens that we can do um, for more of like ha habitat type style building. Like um, my, my backyard, back backyard is like a maple floodplain. Um, and I'm not about to try to build like some pollinator garden in a shady maple floodplain, but I can encourage um, my witch hazels and I can like help pull out. I've got this like invasive ground cover that I'm working on removing um, to help my skunk cabbages. And once my skunk cabbages get big enough and spread, then they're going to take on a whole bunch of really important roles in that kind of area. So, so it really takes thinking about your site in that way and what types of gardens or whatever you're trying to build. Um, this is kind of a fun thing to observe at the nursery too, just because we're growing like such large, like we're growing all the, all the plants we provide every year as best we can. Um, we are not like looking at the farmer's almanac to see if it's a wet year or a dry year or anything like that. Um, and so my first year here, all of the dry things were thriving. And last year, all of the wet things were like gorgeous, gorgeous plants. Um, and so the, a good idea that comes to mind or um, memory that comes to mind is our butterfly milkweed struggled it was just wet and they were <laughs> unhappy um and then we also had some aphids come and kind of chew them down to the ground and we kind of gave up hope a little bit but even like within that one season of just like constant rainstorms no sun everything remaining wet for like weeks at a time um by the end of the season things kind of shifted and started to dry out and then of course it was warmer throughout the fall um and we actually started to see some new growth coming back on those plants so um, I guess like a big lesson is to not give up hope on things, um, just because like they didn't do well earlier in the season, they might come back, um, and the, the plants kind of wait for their best conditions when possible. So, uh, yeah, having as many options as you can for the different possible conditions will, I think, benefit us all pretty well in our gardens. Yeah, that's such a great example. More and I went to throw out, like to dump in the compost, our, our pots that looked empty. Um, and these are potted plants, which are going to struggle more than anything in the ground. Like that's just rule of potted plants. Um, yeah, we went to throw them out and we were like, oh, there's actually like tubers under like pretty fat tubers in this, this Asclepias. And then we started noticing little greens sticking out of them on some of them. And we were like, all right, never mind. You guys get another year. It's You'll come back. It was very encouraging after that like dark rainy season we had. Very little sun. Those sun loving plants uh, are not happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so like, and I think that that's that's another thing that I've learned that like, um, plants are incredibly like resilient. Resilient meaning they can take on trauma and still um, continue to like survive and then thrive and like um for some tree species like they will start to so show signs of stress way before they're actually in a position of um being like being no longer viable um and it's it's like continued years of drought and uh defoliation that are like gonna be the things that like start to kill off some tree species or like defoliation or fungal impact impacts or insects but it's like the like one one drought year is is going to stress it out but maybe not be the end and so and like and and uh, uh plants can handle that that type of stress um not always <laughs> again back to what emily said there will be loss in this but like there 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 is some like capacity to take on that stress um the another question that I thought was interesting um, was given the more extreme weather events and more fluctuations, what are your thoughts on knowing when to transplant? Um, and we can talk a little bit about transplanting and why maybe we do this in the fall. And I think also um, thinking about how I read something about how spring is getting longer on both ends in the Northeast. So like it's how we have warmer marches, but like 
colder and a little net colder and a little bit cloudier maze and so it's like what is happening um and so like what what are you thinking about when we're putting plants in the ground um how to best get them ready to do have that also another moment of stress yeah great question uh yeah our seasons <laughs> our seasons that are so the northeast you know we're supposed to have these four distinct seasons are getting a lot more muddled um and I guess I want to make the distinction between transplanting our seed grown plants into other pots and just planting when it's time to plant in the ground. Um, so, so first I'll just talk about planting in the ground. Um, last year was so weird. <laughs> um, usually we say uh, plant in the fall because it's cooler. Um, you won't have to water as much. The plants will kind of be able to set out some roots and then they go dormant and then they can start their year off strong. Um, because springs, sometimes all of a sudden you get these like super hot Junes, which is like pretty normal for a New England, um, time. And then, but this year it was very cold and very gray and very wet through July, really. Um, and we were finding that, and, and I've talked to a lot of other growers and a lot of other like planters, people that are, are planting things that they, they were we've always told people like, don't plant past May. And we were planting into July for gardens and things like that. Um, so to, I think a lot of it is keeping an eye on your weather um, and, and remembering that kind of key of if it's cool and damp, it's okay to plant. It's okay to move plants around. Um, spring is a, a totally fine time to plant. Uh, our, our big concerns are that we now get these weird cold snaps sometimes. Um, so we know what happened to our fruit trees last May. Um, but if you don't remember, there was a harsh frost uh, in like end of May, I think. And um, a lot of trees that had flowers or buds lost their flowers and then there, there weren't a lot of fruits available. Um, and that was, that was more for like uh, orchard species and things like that. But um, it, it can affect our, our other plants too. Like I, I was concerned this past weekend about our maples. They were all had super swollen buds. Some of them had started flowering in places. That's a super, super important pollen source for our, our early bees. Um, and then everything got coated in ice. Um, they looked okay. I've been like peeking at them all. Uh, but, but time, time will really tell if, if this keeps happening or if it's happening when things are truly in flower, um, you can have some really big issues with, with bud break and things like that. Um, so making sure you're going to have enough time for those plants to kind of get settled in the ground, um, before any frosts or any hot times and things like that. Um, but it, it is shifting. I'm, I'm seeing a pretty major shift in when we can plant and how long into the season we can plant, um, but just kind of also on that line, you know, if you're seeing like all of June is seems like great planting conditions and then something happens like, oh, we were wrong and there's actually no rain and it's super hot for a week. Um, just water your plants, <laughs> um, you know, collect rainwater or whatever, but um, just water them and tend to them to, to give them their best chance, uh, if that makes sense. And then I guess as far as transplanting, if we want to talk about that and dividing plants, that really takes um, keeping an eye on your plants and looking at them if they're getting too crowded. And it, you can tell when a plant is super crowded, they're super touching each other. Even once they've started yellowing, it's like, get them out of that pot and get them into something larger or um, divided up. Uh, but uh, yeah, even when we started seeing um, you always see with, with these species that we at least, um, grow a wild seed project that you have a wide range of germination times, even across, um, species. So like just our seaside golden rods, if pots germinate even within one pot, different seeds are coming up at different times. Um, so it, it takes a little bit more watching and keeping an eye on things. Uh, we already had some lupins germinate. Who knows if they're going to have survived that snow or not. Um, theoretically, they should be able to handle these like more minor fluctuations. You know, now this week they're getting kind of warm rain all week. Um, so it really takes keeping an eye on them and, and keeping them not stressed. Mm. 
I mean, like there are losses. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to glide over that um, or get too depressing with it. But like last year, especially, I think specifically about the sundial lupins we were growing, um, it was just too wet and we didn't catch them soon enough and they were stuck in their pot and they were overcrowded and they did not survive. <laughs> they got moldy and died back. Um, and so that's kind of like an expected thing, though, though, very, very sad. Uh, um, another thing, I guess this is a bit more nursery applicable, but something that um, we've started to do is just when you transplant things, rather than taking, um, you know, your your pot of dozens of plants and putting one individual pot into, oh, sorry, one individual plant into each new pot, kind of doing them in groupings, um, just so that if one does die off or if they don't do too well, you have kind of more opportunity for some of them to thrive. Um, and also you use less pots, which is helpful. What are you saying? Um, yeah, thank you both so much. These are such great questions. Um, I think that there's um, some interesting questions about uh, the way, like, the pressures that introduce species are um, putting onto our forests. I think that that was, there was a comment um, about that in response to talking about the way that drought is not the thing that um, is going to really, I mean, it's one of the stresses, but the main stress is going to be these introduced species and just like predictions or knowledge that you have or like plans that you're making um, for the way in which introduced species are going to be, um, yeah, really, really taking a hard hit on some of our, especially forests and how um, how like seed and diversity um, and um, plays into all of that. And I'm thinking about like APCA and other organizations that are really thinking about what um, having tree species that are have these like 99% mortality rates from introduced pests look like, but also how we continue to do that even as more pests get introduced or move north because of these changing weathers. Um, that's a huge question. So good luck. <laughs> Yeah, that's a big one. Um, yeah, so we, we're going to see more species um, moving in, and those species tend to be the ones that are very uh, quick to to move move in, um, uh, especially insects that can fly, <laughs> um, but also a lot of the plants that um, wouldn't have been able to survive here. I'm thinking like kudzu and stuff like that, that um, is really easy to for people traveling throughout states to accidentally bring up with them um, that now potentially could survive a winter here. Um, it is an important thing to be thinking of and keeping an eye on um, and looking at where people there's there's some work happening with um, model modeling with like the spread of these species throughout the U.S. is, is potentially going to happen. Um, and I, if I can find it, I can share it in the chat. It's it's just like there's some stuff on the Native Plant Trust that um, they've been working with the University of New Hampshire, I believe, in some of that. Um, but it's really important that we think about the impact assessments, but really with, oops, sorry, with invasive species <laughs> um, issues or introduced species that uh, highly impact biodiversity or can can wipe out species like the emerald ash borer. Um, that, that's a tricky one because it's already here, but in invasive species ecology, the best thing that we could do is prevention. Um, past prevention, uh, there's, there's this like really old graph that's been used forever. Um, you have a very small window of being able to actually remove that species and keep it out of habitats. Um, and then from there, you're talking about mitigation um, and trying to uh, remove enough and then replant or reintroduce enough um, to, to help the ecosystem functionings to, to continue. Um, and that happens really quickly. So the, the best thing we can do and the initial thing we can do is prevention um, and, and checking plants, checking shoes, like changing your shoes if you're in an area that you know has um, a bunch of seed of something that you don't want bringing up, you don't want to be bringing up there. Um, and, and I think that that's really, really number one. If I can drive that home, that's the biggest, biggest thing that we can do. Um, the next thing is just like consistent monitoring, um, which 
our, our state is pretty good because we're, we're in kind of a good spot where we can see what's happening in other states around and be proactive, um, which is a lot of been what's happening with Emerald Ash Borer. Um, so there's a really uh, great lab out of the University of Maine. Um, that's the Ash Protection across Wabanakic. Um, and they are a group of university students uh, partnering and uh, indigenous uh, folks that are partnering um, to help both collect seed for ash, for seed banking, for studies, um, but also help um, map and find ash trees around the state um, and help give access to um, basket makers. It's an incredibly important cultural species um, for the Wabanaki people. Um, and you know they know best of how to grow it and how to use it um, and how to find it. Uh, so, so working really um, together with that sort of collaboration um, to help save that species is really important. And it helps with um, monitoring uh, the spread um, it's a winged species, so it can spread faster than a lot of plants can spread. Um, but we're understanding more and more about its biology um, and learning about uh, what we can do. Um, the state website looks like Gary Fish is here anyways, but the state, the state um, has a lot of really great information on their websites about um, all the species that are coming or potentially coming uh, and keeping an eye out on how to, how to best prevent those. I'm going to see if I can find that link. Inside. Yes. Yeah. Emily, you go look um, for that. And then we have uh, about two minutes left. And so, Maura, if you want to add something to that, I totally want you to do that. Um, but then I have one last question. So, great. Um, the only other thing I was going to say is first, um, following firewood regulations is a really good preventative measure as well. <laughs> um, and then when it comes to your like um, uh, plant species rather than insects, um, they're really prone to um, kind of uh, coming into more disturbed sites. Uh, and I just wanted to drop that on the Wild Sea Project website. There is um, an article, I think, called Planting Rugged Natives. Um, that's really helpful for if you have those species on your own property, if you plan to remove them, some alternatives that you can place um, afterwards that will kind of help combat that. Amazing. So good. Well, thank you for those really thorough answers. And thank you everyone. I know we have one minute left um, and people are already hopping off. I know it's probably dinner time, but um, I just wanted to ask Maura and Emily um, in this last little moment, are there things that are making you hopeful as you think towards the future, not just like nervous or worried? <laughs> and if you want to just share those quickly, we, that feels like a much better note to end on. <laughs> um. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? <laughs> no, you can go right, first. Right, I'll go um, so I think I think there's a lot of things that I, I'm hopeful for the future. Um, one, I don't know if this is bleak, but one of the major things is like um, plants, the world is incredibly resilient. Um, humans are just such a blip on the world. Um, Plants have been along for so much longer. Um, and it's really fascinating if you you look through plant records, things like, you know, when angiosperms came onto the scene, pollinators showed up um, and, and, you know, bees all of a sudden exploded in their diversity where it was kind of wasps and then wasps figured out how to use pollen and then bees showed up. Um, and, and we are gonna continue to see that uh, with climate change also being a factor. Um, there's, Nell and I joke a lot about um, moss. Moss is gonna take over the world. Moss can spend so much time being dormant, looking dead and can just come back with the right conditions. Um, and, and seed banks are, are very similar. Um, we truly don't know how long some some seeds are viable within our, our seed seed bank, like the world's seed bank, the seeds that are in our soils um, really just require the right, right conditions, the right really upset of soils to all of a sudden show up. Um, you know, as corny as it sounds, life will find a way, there will always be life. Um, and we'll start to see how how things are shifting. And, and it's kind of, if we can take an, a, an approach where, um, you know, we can be proactive, encourage our uh, governments to, to be more proactive, but also just like use it as a in a chance to observe what's going on can be really nice. Um, you know, I'm seeing 
some warblers not leave the state. I'm seeing like things adapting and using different species. Um, we're, you know, we're seeing that cuckoos, which is like one of my favorite birds, um, potentially can feed on brown tail moth. Um, and they're a bird that's vastly disappearing from our areas because of the lack of the type of forest that they like. Um, one showed up in my yard and not to toot my own horn, but I have way less brown tail moth in my yard than my neighbors do. <laughs> um, but just really using it as an, a way to like experience the world and, and look at things and observe what's happening. Yeah, I feel very similarly. I, I was drawn to this world kind of like almost out of guilt the idea of loss like I could not grapple with it and so I just had this like sense of urgency to kind of experience everything whether that be an environment a habitat a species that I like might miss out on later um and so grateful that that got me into it but now like working with plants on a closer level and like being able to observe them in this changing world you just really can see that like they're not in a rush, you know, like the plants um, are on their own time scale and like things are changing faster than maybe they're equipped to handle, but they're handling it. Um, and I think it's really encouraging to just see that like they're just doing what they were were created to do essentially um, and it's still working for them. And that's been really powerful and keeping me happy throughout all of this. Oh my gosh. I literally have chills. That's <laughs> are just doing what they're made to do. Um, and I'll just add from a human perspective, something that's giving me hope is getting to work with amazing people like um you two and um also amazing companions like plants of like, yeah, there's just so much to learn. So, so much to learn and so much to connect upon. And it's so good. So um with that fast hour that flew by, um, I just want to share my screen one last time for the people that are still here um, and say that we are Wild Seed Project. We are a nonprofit, so um, membership is something that keeps us going. We have seeds that can help you plant for climate resilience. We have a plant sale that can help you plant for climate resilience with an even more definite, <laughs> potentially definite actually after all this conversation there's nothing that's definite um but <laughs> there's at least a plant <laughs> that you can put in the ground um we have our three uh guides that we've been talking about that can help you make decisions about where you're planting in um and we have this new guide coming out planting for climate resilience you become a member now um you can get a pre-ordered or you get a free copy of that um shipped to you before everyone else gets to get there so that's just a little perk um of membership and um, there is also a monthly Q&A where you can talk to Emily and more and myself um, to ask some of these questions as they come up on a more personal level. But we are so grateful for all of the time that you all spent with us this evening um, and for these really great questions. We had no idea what was going to come out of this. And um, this was a really fruitful conversation. So thank you all so, so much. Um, I'm going to figure out how to save the Q&A, so this will stay open for a second, but um, you can leave. And um, yeah, thank you for being here. Amazing. First, chat.